And welcome back to another episode of our Magnum Opus podcast. I'm your host, Drew O'Neill, and today we're not going to interview anybody. We're not going to... I'm not going to delve into the inner secrets of a specific composer or a famous musician. I thought we'd try something a little bit different today. It's 2021, excuse me, so it's New Year and we have new resolutions. I'd like to start a new resolution for our podcast. I'm going to give you guys a word of the month. And I'm very excited for this because um, we get to sort of talk more about the nitty gritties about music and about some of the finer details. And I'm not really talking about word of the month being crescendo or pizzicato, some of the first words that we learn as musicians. I'm really excited and I'm really hoping to look at some of the more difficult or some of the more advanced concepts. And I'll spend some time to break things down for you guys and we can explore new ideas and maybe new ways of looking at music. So the first word that I'd love to talk to you guys about is called timbre. And it's spelled T-I-M-B-R-E. So it's spelled like timber, like a tree falling over, but oddly enough, it's pronounced timbre. And it's a fairly advanced musical concept. And whether you are a beginning musician, intermediate, or maybe even a, a college, if anyone out there is in college and listening, probably to you. But the goal here, I'm going to break it down in a way that we can hopefully all understand and we'll all learn a little bit more about it. So what the heck is timbre? Pretty much, it boils down to how composers and musicians choose musical instruments to either fit a specific mood that they are trying to create or to enhance something like a musical line that they have already made. Timbre is the reason why a piano sounds like a piano and a violin sounds like a violin, and every other instrument in between. When you play the same note on a cello, why the heck does it ring differently? Why does it sound different than if you play the exact same note on an electric guitar? And speaking of electric guitar, we're gonna talk about why it's really important to have distortion effects, and what those distortion effects can do when rock musicians are attempting to portray something with their music. And I want to have a first example here. We're going to do a little bit of a mind experiment. Can you picture for me your favorite scene from your favorite movie or just any scene that comes to mind immediately? Try to picture what's going on, what the protagonist is doing or what the villain is doing or if it's a musical, who is singing, anything like that. Try to picture the plot. Try to picture the music if you can. And now I want you to try to identify some of the instruments that are being played. For me, I'm picturing Let It Go from Frozen. And I can easily hear Elsa's voice. It's just ringing through. But what's accompanying her? We have piano. We have some light drums going on in the background. And then we have the orchestra that swells up too. But if we just take a look at the intro, right as right as that song begins we elsa is like out and sorry i'm about to spoil um frozen if you still haven't seen it like if you live under a rock but elsa is banished herself to like the frozen waste she's in the mountains and all this fun stuff but the snow doesn't bother her so she's surrounded by these swirling snowflakes and everything is floating down and when the piano starts to that song it's almost like the same delicate snowflakes are falling, but you can hear that in musical form. Try to picture, go listen to the song really quick. And now that we're back, try to picture that opening piano part if it's played on, let's say a trombone. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Or a saxophone. Yeah, still doesn't really do it justice for me. The reason I would say and I haven't done any research, this is just my personal opinion here. I believe that the composers picked piano for this because the sound is so clear. You press a key and it rings. There's no, there's almost no articulation to the note that starts with air or the bow, it's just plunk. So it, the note begins so clearly and so precisely, but they're also delicate. 
and all of those individual piano notes are ringing differently. And I just picture each of them as individual snowflakes. Now, maybe if Elsa was the queen of fire and she was in this active volcano and everything, and there's like eruptions everywhere, and but she had the same theme song, I maybe would not picture a piano. I might picture if she had the same theme, maybe now is a good time for the brass to come in with maybe a more punchy fanfare. Because to me, that kind of symbolizes fire. It's a little more destructive. It's maybe sort of more rambunctious. But if we go back to Frozen, Elsa, and she's on this mountaintop, the piano is delicate. It's in its higher register, right? It's got some of those higher octaves going on. So I can easily picture the clarity of snow and the really, really cold chilliness. So I want you to go back, think a little bit about your favorite moment in film, or it could be anything. Music's all around us. So maybe it's part of a video game, or maybe it's part of a pop song. Anything that you're like, wow, that was catchy, and I'm remembering that. Think about what instruments they were using and that emotion that it elicited from you. Let's go back a little bit and talk about emotion. So if we think about timbre, it can't just stop at what we're feeling. It has to also go a little bit deeper. Composers think about timbre and how timbre, if you do like a Google on timbre, you're gonna get a really complicated <laughs> definition. So I'm gonna water it down as much as I can for you guys. When composers think about timbre or when they think about composing a piece, timbre plays a really, really big part, especially for film or video game or opera composers. It's important for anybody, but I would probably say those three types of music, their timbre is always at the forefront of the composer's mind. So if we think about each instrument here, the way instruments are created, they kind of go back to how civilization was formed and all this fun stuff. We had horns that we would blow in and that developed maybe into the brass that we know today. But instruments are also created to help us feel and express emotion. So it's when instruments are created, determining what materials go into the instrument, for example, why maybe the violin is made out of wood and not plastic. Wood rings differently than plastic wood. So part of it is because you can just play it better, but part is also because we as humans want the sound of a violin for a specific reason, because it elicits a certain emotion. Fun fact about the saxophone, it is when you analyze the harmonics and you compare the wavelengths of a saxophone playing and a human voice singing, the saxophone is the closest instrument phonetically to the human voice. So the alto saxophone specifically. I personally, I can, I don't really know if I can see it, but you, I mean, can't really argue with math there. So one last trip around, let's talk about timbre again. The reason why it is so important is because composers think about a mood that they want to express. Think about a scary film. And if you've never watched one, good for you. But when you're watching a scary horror film, sure there's jump scares where loud sound crashes in and you get startled. But whenever something scary is about to happen, what is playing? Usually very low rumbling, ominous notes. If you've ever seen Jaws, for example, even though it opening credits, very, very, very famous scene. Some of you are probably way too young to watch it, but that's okay. The soundtrack for it is very famous. Yeah, it is the lowest two notes on a string bass. Bottom, bottom. And not only is it the fact that it's on a string bass in a tuba that causes like this tension for it, but the composer used these very, very low tones to really bring about this very heavy ominousness to the film. And if you think about, instead of a horror film, let's talk about a heroic film. Something just happened and the hero just won. The end of Star Wars, for example, any Star Wars film, big heroic brass fanfare comes in and the composer is using these instruments to help 
allocate senses of, of just joy and, and bravery and, and celebration. And he uses big crashing chords and all this fun, large, open, open instruments so they can really go wild for things like that. So every everything that a composer thinks about when they are writing music, they always have to take into account timbre. They always want to have specific instruments play specific parts. And you can even think about melody versus harmony. What instruments usually play the melody? Well, <laughs> we can generalize a little bit. They're the higher pitched ones. So violins or flutes and clarinets, saxophones sometimes, maybe trumpets. If we think about instruments that rarely get the melody, we can think about string basses. We can think about timpani drums. We can think about trombones. These lower instruments that generally are also harder to hear, but you usually want the melody in a range that the human voice can sing, because then it's a little bit more memorable. In the violin, the flute, the clarinet, these tend to be within the human range. It's kind of hard to sing as low as a trombone. So all of that, if all of it went over your head, that's absolutely okay. Timbre is something that's so much fun to do a little bit of research on, and as any musician, it's really important just to know a little bit about. So next time you're playing in an ensemble, think about how your part not only fits into the chamber music as a whole, but also literally how your instrument is making a difference in the whole scale of the entire composition. Because that's kind of cool. Don't think about it too much because you could easily get lost. But thank you everybody. I do not have a practice tip for you today because we spent my practice tip is think about timbre when you play. And that's gonna kind of hurt your brain a little bit. But enjoy your week, everyone, and I will see you next time on Magnum Opus. <laughs>